Hello everybody and welcome back to Land Law. In this lesson we're moving on to the third chapter of our studies, focusing on this idea of registered title, the registered title system. In this lesson we'll take an introduction to the concept of registered land, as well as the implications of the existence of the land registry and some of the principles that exist on the land registry as well. So, this is a new topic, essentially, that we're going to introduce, the subject of registered title. The vast majority of you who end up becoming solicitors and uh, and working within this area of the law will probably be dealing with the principles and ideas of registered title. Given the fact that the vast majority of land that exists in England and Wales today is registered and uh, and is increasingly growing in terms of the amount of registered title that is, um, or at least the amount of title that is being registered as time goes on. So it's very important that we spend some time examining this in more detail. And so we'll look at some of the ideas relating to the subject of registered title as well as the nature of the land register and some of the principles which are encoded by the land register. So if we remember back to earlier lessons, there was one thing that we was talking about in relation to the purchase of unregistered line, uh, of unregistered title, unregistered land. This was this idea of the, the, the concept of unregistered conveyancing, but we also remember that there are usually two main considerations which ought to be made when it when we talk about the purchase of an estate if i was the purchaser of title of an estate of 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 some land whether it be registered or whether it be unregistered there are generally two questions that i'm going to ask the first question is who has good title does the person who i'm uh, selling or buying the property from actually have title to be able to sell it to me that's the first question. Who owns the property? Second question is, what legal and or equitable interests exist over said property, over that title? Now, if you remember back to the lessons when we looked at the unregistered land um, system, it was relatively difficult to answer some of these questions. So when it comes to the uh, who owns what, what, um, what, what title, you would have to go through the history of title deeds and you would have to um, essentially go back as far as 15 years to, to establish who has some kind of chain of, of connection in terms of ch chain of ownership. When it comes to what legal and equitable interests exist over the uh, over the land for unregistered title, you have to rely on the doctrine of notice. You have to rely on the Land Charges Act, and you also have to rely on the process of overreaching. All of which uh, we have covered in more detail in previous lessons. And so, if you want to see those lessons, um, head over to the playlist that we have established. Well, the Land Registration Act intends to improve upon this particular issue and essentially tries to solidify something of a more substantial method by which we can understand the process of A, who owns the title, and B, who, are, uh, who has um, the good legal or equitable interests over said title. So let's think about registered title then. The idea behind the legislation and the Re Land Registration Act is to create a central and reliable database for which individuals can find land, can find the owners of land, and may even be able to find interest which exists over the land. This is known as the Land Registry. Now, the Land Registry is a place um, that essentially has uh, physical documentation of registered title, but you can also look on the Land Registry online um, nowadays. And the concept of the land registry is a centralized system by which an individual can find all reliable information pertaining to the ownership of in and interest that exist over the land. So given that this is the case, given that this is the case, uh, and given the fact that the purchase of land is legally and logistically complicated, and the fact that the land registry is in completely has to be incredibly accurate and not have any kind of mistakes owing to the legal and logistically complicated issues relating to the purchase of land, there are a number of principles which exist within the concept of, of registered land and the land registry that essentially tries to ensure um, that, the, that the land registry itself is um, very accurate, okay? Because if it wasn't, if it wasn't particularly very accurate, then a mistake could potentially cause a buyer or seller to lose a lot of money. And so, or could 
potentially cause a buyer or seller to be bound to interest that they did not want to be bound to and wouldn't have purchased the title if they'd known otherwise. So let's have a look at what the foundational principles of the land registry are. There are three, the first being the mirror principle, the second being the curtain principle, and the third being the insurance principle. Beginning first then with the mirror principle, the idea of the mirror principle is this view that the land registry ought to properly reflect and accurately reflect reality. That is why it's called the mirror principle. It's supposed to mirror reality. This means that there ought not to be a real need to go in and, and, and have to uh, essentially um, do a lot of deep investigative in examinations of registered title. One should and ought to be able to just simply look at the land registry itself and find the information they need relating to maybe who owns the title, as well as what kind of interest exists over the title. That's the idea. The, the, uh, the, the, the land registry ought to properly reflect the basic ideas of who owns the property and who may have legal or equitable interest over said property. And you can have a look on the land registry if you go online and you can type in the address of some property and it will give you the owner's name. It will also give you some of the uh, interest which may exist over said property now it doesn't give you all the exists uh, the interest that exists over uh, all the property and we will get to concepts of overriding interests which are interests which override the land registry and override a registrable disposition uh, all of which we will get to in the future um, but they are seen to be representative of what has sometimes been described as a cro crack in the mirror and so we'll talk about this in more detail but for the most part the mirror principle is supposed to essentially allow the land registry to accurately reflect reality in conjunction with the mirror principle you have the concept of the uh, curtain principle this principle relates to the protection of certain pieces of confidential information let's say that there exists some property and that this property is part of a trust which is held for some beneficiaries the idea behind the, uh, the curtain principle is that a purchaser does not need to look behind the curtain, i.e. does not need to go about and do a number of different pieces of investigations over such interest, and that these interests simply ought to just be overreachable um, at the point of purchase. And so the idea here is that um, where a situation exists where you have some kind of trust that could, be, that could exist over the land for some beneficiary, a restriction will be entered into the register, which will then inform the potential purchaser that a certain amount of particular due process is required in order for the insurance of this interest to be overreached. We will get to what a restriction is in, in a future lesson's time. We'll get to the concept of notices and restrictions in more detail. But for now, just note that the curtain principle essentially allows for confidential interest to be protected uh, and essentially just informs a purchaser of the process of overreaching which may be required. Finally then we have the insurance principle. Now what the insurance principle tells us is that the interests and rights of people relying on the register are going to be protected by the state. So the idea behind the land register is to reflect reality insofar as it can and to be an accurate reflection of what that kind of land looks like and what that kind of land, um, who owns that kind of land and what interest exists over that kind of land. Um, where there is some mistake in the land register and this mistake brings about some loss to an individual, then the insurance principle tells us that the uh, the state ought to properly compensate that person. And what this does is it means that people are able to rely on the register for information. So there is trust in the land register. And it also means that the state is incentivized to take good care to ensure that the register is accurate. In the previous lesson, what we did was introduce the concept of registered land and specifically the land registry in and of itself. This lesson is going to talk about the concept of registered dispositions. And we're going to start to try and introduce the various different processes by which interests in land, which are subsidiary to the purchaser of an estate, for example, are actually protected against those individuals who are looking to and seeking to purchase property. And the reason for this is because just like with the previous lessons, when we looked at unregistered title and we examined things like the doctrine of notice and we talked about the ways in which land charges act essentially made uh, various changes to things like the doctrine of notice. 
when it comes to registered title, there are various different ways in which interests may be protected against a purchaser. Uh, essentially, what we mean here is that may be bound to a purchaser in various different ways. So, as an introduction, we're going to talk about the concept of dispositions in this lesson, some ch something which will come up in more detail in future lessons' time. We will talk about what a disposition is and the process by which registrable is, uh, dispositions sorry, ought to be entered, and then finally looking at the system of priority. This is also more of a terminology lecture, if you will, given the fact that we're going to be using phrases like registrable disposition. We're going to be talking about uh, interests which take priority over registrable dispositions. We're going to talk about phrases such as uh, things like um, uh, interests which override a registrable disposition, uh, all this kind of stuff. All of this is very, very important language that we're going to have to need to understand for our, uh, for our understanding of how we examine land law, specifically registered title. So the first question that we're going to ask is, what is a disposition? Broadly, a disposition is an all-encompassing term, which includes a number of rights which are granted to the owner of a registered estate, of registered title. It includes, among various other things, the transfer of the freehold estate. It could involve the creation of new interests in that property. And it is generally viewed that the owner of said estate has a near unlimited right in terms of the administration of such dispositions. Remember that even though the concept of ownership of land doesn't really make much sense in the context of England and Wales because the crown owns all of the property in the country, when we talk about things like freehold estates and the ownership of a freehold, uh, you basically de facto own the property. So you have, as a result of which, near unlimited rights in the administration of such dispositions. The powers of an owner in an estate, uh, which is a registered estate, is highlighted by Section 23 of the Land Registration Act 2002. And the Land Registration Act says the following. It says that the owner's powers in relation to a registered estate consists of the power to make a disposition of any kind permitted by the general law in relation to an interest of that description other than a mortgage by demise or subdemise. So as we see here, um, there is a limitation uh, or two limitations that we can see here in this first provision. Uh, firstly is other than a mortgage by demise or subdemise, but secondly is just a disposition of any kind which is permitted by the general law. So you can't break the law in the creation of a disposition. Secondly, the power to change the estate at law with the payment of money. And then secondly, uh, part two of section 23, should I say, says that the owner's powers in relation to a registered charge consists of the power to make a disposition of any kind permitted by the general law in relation to the interest of that description other than a legal sub mortgage. And then finally, the power to change at law with payment of money indebtedness secured by the registered charge. OK. So all of this is generally quite wishy-washy language. You don't need to understand and have a detailed uh, analysis of specifically Section 23 of the Land Registration Act uh, or be able to recite it in, in specific detail. But this is just a general overview of what a owner has in terms of powers over registered title in relation to this particular area of the law. So carrying on then. When we go from section 23 to section 27, the Land Registration Act outlines a number of rights and interests in land which are subject to what are known as registration requirements. These are therefore titled um, registrable dispositions. Okay. So section 27 says that if a disposition of a registered charge is required to be completed by registration, it does not operate at law until the relevant registration requirements are met. In the case of a registered estate, the following dispositions which are required to be completed by registrations. So the following are dispositions which are required to be uh, re uh, completed by registration. These include a transfer, uh, uh, we also have where a registered estate is an estate in land, the grant of term of uh, years absolute, for a term of more than seven years from the date of the grant, to take effect in possession after the end of the period of three months be uh, beginning with the date of the grant, under which the right of possession di is discontinuous, etc, etc, etc. Again, 
this is not uh, information that you need to have a, a, an under, a deep, uh, recitable understanding of. You don't need to be able to recite section 27 verbatim. Um, this is just to give you a more general understanding of, of the ways in which dispositions are operated by the Land Registration Act. And then this is stuff that you will be coming across in more detail when we start to look at the process of purchasing an estate and the conveyancing of an estate in relation to interest which may bind a purchaser. And in addition to that, let's think about what the issue or the phrase uh, priority refers to and the idea of priority. Uh, essentially, what priority aims to do is to determine which rights and interests will bind other rights and interests. So given a long, um, long uh, old piece of land um, that has quite a long history, uh, there may be a variety of different interests, all of which have varying different strengths. Some may be legal, some may be equitable, etc., etc., etc. And the idea of priority is to determine which of these interests will bind the other interests. Uh, where does the who whose interest binds the others, or vice versa? And you can think of priority in this regard as something like a queue. So there may be a long list of interests and rights which exist over the registered title, all of which being entered into at various, various different times. And so when a new disposition takes place, let's say the transfer of title under Section 27.2a of the Land Registration Act, the question of these interests and which ones will take priority is a question of which of these interests will bind said purchaser of an estate. That's what we're trying to determine. And what we're going to do in the next lesson is start to talk about that in more detail, uh, examining the concept of priority and examining the exceptions to priority, um, the, the role of notices or, or restrictions in the register, and then the idea of Schedule 3 of the Land Registration Act, which outlines things which are overriding interests, interests which override a registrable disposition, and the process by which you go to essentially achieve that and to prove that in these kinds of cases. Welcome back everybody to our studies in land law. We're continuing talking about registered land in this lesson, focusing on the idea of registered interests and the processes and the methods by which an interest can be registered and the, 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 essentially the three methods that are, that, are, um, that, that, that are available for an individual registering an interest in a particular piece of registered land. So we're going to be examining uh, interests which are protected by registration. Remember, the process by which land law operates, at least when it comes to the conveyancing of property, is first of all, you have to know who actually is the true vendor of the property, i.e. the individual who owns the property. This is relatively easy to do when it comes to uh, registered land because you have the land registry. The land registry is a simple database that we can use and, 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 and examine who owns what property. The second question is, OK, well, this is the owner of the property. What about third party interest, whether they be legal or equitable, that I could be bound to if I was to purchase this property? Uh, and this is really where we spend a lot of our time examining uh, land law, specifically registered title. So let's think about the methods by which, let's say, you are an equitable uh, third party. Uh, say you have a third party interest that is equitable, or you maybe have a legal third party interest in the property, uh, and you want to register that interest so that any future purchaser will be bound to it. Well, there are interests which exist over a piece of land that the owner uh, will have to make clear that this interest exists by placing it into the land register itself. And then this would essentially protect that property uh, interest against any any future uh, purchaser. The aim of this is, of course, to ensure that the mineral principle is adhered to. You want, if you are a purchaser of land, when it comes to registered title, you want to know that uh, the the land register reflects, insofar as possible, the land that you are purchasing and everything to do with the land that you are purchasing and all the obligations you may have over the land that you are purchasing. And so the mirror principle adheres to the view that you want essentially the registration of land or registered land to reflect reality insofar as it possibly can. And this also ties into the idea of a compensation principle, whereby if there are mistakes on the land register and those mistakes are the fault of the land registry itself, the government compensates any loss that could uh, be incurred as a result of said mistake. However, there are interests which are not in the register. And those interests may be um, able to still bind a purchaser to an estate. 
Um, these are known as overriding interests, or sometimes described as interests which override a registrable disposition. And we will get to those in future lessons time, uh, uh, because we have to then go and have a look at Schedule 3, and we have to look at some of the case law that examines things like actual occupation, uh, all of which will be in the future. Um, but we'll get to them in future lessons as well. And there's there is a critique of the land register and the concept of overriding interests being registrable and, and binding onto a purchaser, because they are not reflected on the land register and so are sometimes referred to as a quote crack in the mirror under the original law of registered title all the way back in 1925 there were three ways in which an individual would be able to register their interests and make it very clear to a, a, a potential purchaser that that interest is going to bind them uh, they could do so through a notice they could do so through a caution, or they could have done so through a restriction. Now, when we see a reform to the law with the Land Registration Act in 2002, the middle of those, the idea of cautions, were removed. So for the most part, we are th thinking about and focusing on notices and restrictions. Uh, let's spend our time in this lesson focusing on the idea of a notice in the register before in the next lesson talking about restrictions in the register. What are notices? Well, these are the simplest to understand and the very and they're very easy to 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 recognize in law because a notice is simply an entry into the land register, which makes it clear that the interest in which the notice is being made is highlighted. It's as simple as that. And if you have an interest, which is a third party right over a piece of registered land, then the use of a notice is the easiest way to make sure you can protect that right and also have priority over those who may purchase the land in the process of a registrable disposition. We know what priority means from the previous lesson. Priority refers to this idea of almost a queue whereby whereby the the whereby uh, whereby things are which are older essentially interests which may be older uh, bind the newer purchasers and um the problem when it comes to uh, priority and uh, and the purchase of land is that when there is a new purchaser of the property, um, the they almost sometimes jump the queue. And so you need things like notices and you need things like restrictions. And then you also need things like overriding interests under Schedule 3 to ensure that your right is still protected against that new purchaser. So let's turn to the legislation itself. And... Uh, I'm aware that a lot of these lessons are very legislation heavy, but we will in future get to a lot more case law uh, when we talk about land and property regulation in the future. Uh, but for now, we're just going to focus more on the on the uh, on the legislation. Section 32 of the Land Registration Act says the following. They say that a notice is an entry in the register in respect of the burden of an interest affecting a registered estate or a charge. The entry of notice is to be made in relation to the registered estate or charge affected by the interest concern. The fact that an interest is subject of a notice does not necessarily mean that it is valid, but it does mean that the priority of interest, if valid, is protected for the purposes of section 29 and section 30. We'll get to sections 29 and 30 in a second, uh, but for the most part, when we think about what a notice does, it does not necessarily mean that it is valid, but if it is valid, it protects us the interests for the purposes of sections 29 and 30 of the Land Registration Act. Section 33 of the Land Registration Act outlines what are known as excluded interests, and they say that no notice may be entered in the register in respect of any of the following. So it's talking about things that can't be entered into the register as a notice. These include an interest under a trust of land or under a lands or a settled uh, sorry a settlement under the Settled Land Act of 1925, a leasehold estate which is granted for a term of years uh, of years of three or less from the date of the grant and is not required to be registered, a restrictive covenant made between the lessor and the lessee so far as relating to the demise premises. An interest which is capable of being registered under Part 1 of the Commons Act 2006. And then finally an interest in any coal or coal mine, the rights attached to any such interest uh, and the rights of any such person under Sections 38, 49, 51 of the Coal Industry Act of 1994. 
A lot of these aren't particularly relevant. You don't really need to know about coal and coal mines unless you are learning about um, coal law, <laughs> which I don't know if it is even a thing. Uh, well, I guess it is to an extent. Um, but for the most part, we're thinking about things like trusted land settlements. We're talking about leasehold estates uh, of particular qualities and things like a restrictive covenant. In the previous lesson, what we did was explore the concept of notices within the remit of interests, which can be put on the land register as a way of protecting said interest against new purchasing i.e. the purchasing of the estate by a, uh, another person through the conveyance of property. This lesson is going to talk about the second method by which uh, interest can be protected against that of a new purchaser, this being through the use of what are known as restrictions. So, like I said, the previous lesson, we talked about the principle of notices as uh, as enshrined in the land registry. This lesson, we're going to explore the me next method by which an interest can be registered um, and protected on a registered estate. This is the imposition of a restriction. Now, simply put, and given a very brief overview of this particular topic, all a restriction is is something which can limit the owner of a registered state, estate, shall I say, um, from doing certain things with their land. Okay, it goes and it, it, it is understood as the ordinary definition of the word. It restricts in some kind of way. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We'll get to it as we go on throughout this lesson. But simply put. That's what a restriction is. It is something which can limit the owner of a registered estate from doing certain things with their land. We regulate restrictions using the Land Registration Act of 2002, specifically talking about sections 40 to 41. An entry of a restriction will automatically limit the proprietor from dealing with the land in certain ways so they restrict the cert that they restrict a number of different in a number of different ways the things that people can do with their land the proprietor can do with their land let's explore this then through the legislation let's talk first about section 40 of the 2002 land registration act this particular provision relates to the nature of restrictions and it says that a restriction is an entry in the register regulating the circumstances in which a disposition of a registered estate or charge may be the subject of an entry in the register okay so it regulates as i'm as i'm going to just repeat to, uh, this provision here it regulates the circumstances in which a disposition of a registered estate may be the subject of an entry in the register it also includes charges as well but we'll get to uh, we'll, we'll, we'll focus mainly on the com uh, the concept of dispositions of registered estates a restriction may in particular prohibit the making of an entry in respect of any disposition or a disposition of a kind specified in the restriction it may pro uh, prohibit the making of an entry indefinitely for a period specified in the restriction or until the occurrence of an event so specified. So these are the ways in which a restriction can uh, essentially prohibit the making of an entry in the register in relation to a specific disposition. Remember, a disposition is a number, uh, is, is a phrase to essentially represent a collection of things which uh, can happen over land. One of the things is the purchase of an estate, for example, the conveyance is a, is a type of disposition. And the second point um, here is that according to what the restriction may uh, include, the contents of the restriction, there is the possibility for the restriction to prohibit the making of an entry forever uh, and indefinitely uh, ensure that no entry in the register will be made in respect of the disposition in question or for a period specified in the restriction. So if the restriction says that an entry of the disposition cannot be entered um, for a period of 10 years, for example, then this would represent for a period specified. Or they could say that a restriction restricts an entry of a disposition for a particular 
time until a particular thing has happened. So this sort of gives us a bit of a relative um, specification as to as to the time period that is cited, because of course um, the time period that is cited will uh, change depending on when the event so occurs. It will also be relating to a specific subject matter. So part so subsection two b relates to the sort of temporal jurisdiction of a restriction, um, i.e., um, how long a restriction can be in place for. Part two a talks about the subject matter of a restriction, i.e., it can make it can be made in terms of and in respect of any disposition or of a disposition of a kind which will be specified in the restriction itself. So it could be general, or it could be specific to a, uh, to a specific kind of disposition. Now, the nature of restrictions are also cited in some further rules to the Land Registration Act, which are the Land Registration Rules from 2003. I believe these are also cited in uh, your statute books, if you get the ordinary statute book. Um, but I, I don't quote me on that. I, I'll have to have a look in a second. Um, but I'm pretty sure these rules are also cited uh, in the statute books as well. Schedule 4 of the 2003 Land Registration Rules outlined what are known as the standard forms in which a restriction could take, so what a restriction essentially looks like. A lot of them, 33 of them in particular, um, uh, exist in terms of the standard forms, but here are some interesting examples. So, for example, a, disposition, a restriction could exist on dispositions by sole proprietor, they could be dispositions by trustees in which a certificate is required and a restriction is therefore in place. They could even be restrictions on dispositions on personal representatives. Um, Non-exempt charity, trustee in bankruptcy and beneficial interest, again, certificate required. Notice here that I've not just cited and listed them in order. I've just picked out some of the uh, quite interesting ones. Um, and specifically when we talk about trusts in land, which we'll get to in the next topic, um, the, the, the final one, the idea of a trustee in bankruptcy with a beneficial interest um, is also very important uh, and also if you're talking about uh, equity and trusts non-exempt charities can also fall into that remit to an extent as well so that's what a restriction is in theory and what a restriction is in law and how it is represented by the legislation but how do restrictions actually work and look in practice well we'll take the example of a trust in land uh, which could be the subject of a restriction of uh, sorry one of the things that we have already mentioned in previous lessons is the idea of overreaching and the idea of overreaching is essentially a method which seeks to protect both the interests of a purchaser, but also try to protect the interests of the beneficiaries who will be the benefit, uh, beneficiaries of the property in question under a trust. So where there is a purchaser who is looking to purchase an estate uh, and th that particular estate is actually held on trust for some beneficiaries, the concept of overreaching can exist as a way to essentially uh, to essentially liquidate the trust on the one hand uh, but also to do so in a way which allows the purchaser to purchase the estate and for the beneficiaries to actually see some benefit from the fact that they are beneficiaries under the trust what overreaching essentially does is replace the property element of the trust with financial compensation so if we have the property which is in the trust imagine imagine the trust is like a big bag with the property inside of it what overreaching essentially does is reaches into that uh, trust takes out the property and replaces that property with a sufficient amount of monetary compensation the idea here is that a purchaser is happy because they get to purchase the property and that the beneficiaries are also happy because they uh, get some compensation under the trust one rule that there is is a requirement um, is that of at least two trustees for a valid disposition to ensure the property can be overreached. And in such a circumstance, a restriction should be entered into the register to ensure that there are indeed two trustees to protect the interest of beneficiaries. So this is one way and one example in which we can take an example of a trust of land, which we'll get to in the next chapter, uh, chapter sorry, and also um, talk about the, the method by which restrictions can actually be utilized in practice.